Arvin's is is that a, a Stanley Cup? Stanley Cup. Oh, is that is that what people are talking about? <laughs> I don't know what the kids are the kids are all kids about. Kids are talking about Stanley things. Cups and people are like, oh, you you could buy a Stanley Cup? And people, yeah. what's the story here? I've heard about this now twice in two different conversations. Uh, maybe that's where we start the recording with Juanis explaining this to me like I'm a toddler. Oh, oh we're already we're already recording. Okay, oh, so let's, pa let's pause for a second, and then I'm gonna ask the question, and okay. and then you can chime in. Want to sound good? Uh, uh, sure, I'll do my best. All right, let's give it in four, three. All right, Juanis, what's the deal with the Stanley Cup thing? So the Stanley Cup, as far as I understand it, and and I don't pretend to be an expert on this, but Stanley created a series of mugs, insulated mugs. Are we talking that, about Stanley, the tool company? Stanley, the tool company. Okay. I have their screwdrivers. Yes. They created some insulated mugs that for whatever reason, in true Beanie Baby, Cabbage Patch style, have become the rage that everyone needs to have one. Mahul, is that a Stanley Cup? <laughs> uh, not yet. It's going to turn into one soon. <laughs> Pour water on it. But but let's okay. be real. Not just any Stanley Cup. We're not talking the blue collar OG olive green Stanley Stanley Cup. We're talking Target bougie white. What is Stanley sell out? Pink. I don't know. Oh, they no. they have been sold out. They have been sold out. There are fights about it. I am going to send a little Carhartt too. Here. Carhartt's quality has slipped so much in recent years because they've decided to cheapen the product to make better margins. And it's upsets me. I can't get the high, like the really, I still have some, I was able to buy the last two because I have this ridiculously weird size because I'm tall and, and fit. So my size pants don't fit most people. And there were two left on like the for sale rack. And so I bought them. I don't even like the color, but they fit. So I bought them of that rough duck material that Carhartt has that I love so much because it lasts forever. Um, okay, so this is the CNN Stanley Cup craze. I'm going to open this link. Why not? Let's share for our viewers here. Share the screen. We also have a tab for Revenue Cloud, so that's great. We can segue right into that. The Stanley craze begs the question, why do we love our special little cups so much? Okay, so these cups look exactly like every other cup on earth. Right. Exactly. Is it just because of the play on words with the hockey, you know, like, and how many people who are buying this Stanley Cup know anything about the Stanley Cup from hockey? No. You know I, what? Just knew that oh, one. I just knew the first one. That, okay, it's, <laughs> a, it's a trophy when you win the NHL playoffs. Exactly. It, I all these no questions idea that either. you're asking, John, are beyond me. You know, it's just one of those things. It got hot for whatever reason. And of course, cool, they have them, they have but... them placed on top of a yoga mat and a yoga block. I was gonna say it's me. the women who walk around Starbucks, or excuse me, walk around Target well, you're right, you're right, Starbucks walk around with their pumpkin after, spice after latte. Hot yoga. And they got their little dog and their fucking purse. Yes, and then they leave in their their big old honking Jeep Wagoneer that's ah, crooked because they can't well, drive. Range right. Rover. It's a white Range Rover. It is. <laughs> I mean, it's I the, that's the new soccer it. mobile. <laughs> it's the new soccer mobile. Is the Range Rover? Watch me yes. get canceled in the Salesforce industry for saying <laughs> such things. It's and like, their kids are named Serenity, but it's spelled <laughs> completely off the wall. <laughs> It's like yeah. I just glanced through the article. Uh, it's, it's like one of those latest fads, right? Like when Apple Watch came, everybody wanted Apple Watch. Now yeah. it's a cup, so everybody wants this cup. It's well, like then you're the one of the cool kids if you get the cup. It, pretty also, much. That's let's check I'm, out the yeah. ads if you want an insight into my brain. Uh, let's see here. What is John Google? Apparently, <laughs> it thinks I want to get Mailchimp. What else do we got? H and M. Do I look like an H and M kind of guy? Come on. Yes, now. you do. Really? Have Are you, you being your, serious? Have you seen your beard <laughs> lately? You're in all the ads. You, you are the you are the guy. Shit. Man, I wouldn't buy it. H&M doesn't fit me. I'm too big. They they're for like H&M is for I don't know. Medium, it doesn't have tall, to fit you. 
Medium it has to width. fit the look. Yeah. It has to it has to fit the look. We oh, got Xfinity Mobile. No, I'm not doing that. Uh, let's see. What do we got? Janu Let it grow, January. <laughs> oh, I booked some Marriott earlier today, so these ads are following me around. I'm going to be going yeah. to Vancouver for a client on site soon, uh, next week actually, and then I'm going to. Just maybe we'll need to cancel or move the session. Maybe I'll just start moving sessions if they don't fit the time. You'll all get updates here on the calendar invite. Uh, and then uh, in March, I'll be at uh, Trailblazer DX 2024 in San Francisco. Oh, Mahula, you're going? Yes. Nice. Awesome. I've been, uh, I've be been cool. told I should go. I'm not feeling it, though. You know? Is it going to be paid for? No. I got to pay for it. Oh. Well, then don't go. Okay. Yeah. I'm not. I mean, Say no more. My asshole boss wants me to go, so I'm gonna go. <laughs> it's recording. <laughs> well, oh, Mahul, you, I swear on this all the time. That's part of my brand. I'm like the non-professional consultant that you actually trust. Aren't you your own? Are boss you hiding? <laughs> yeah. I will be eventually, probably. My dad's pretty convinced that I'll be hiring at some point, and I'm probably gonna poach from people on this call because I'm effectively training you myself. <laughs> so. What were you saying, Wannis? I said, aren't you your own boss? Yeah. And my boss is oh. an asshole. Okay. I figured so, so, John, if I complete this PPQ um, super badges and trailhead, will that What's make me well qualified for the role? It, it, I mean, it'll certainly help. What is with these clickbaity ads? Who is clicking on this shit? I don't understand. Um, probably women with a lot of wrinkles that don't like them. <laughs> this is why I, I subscribe to a print edition of The Economist and a print edition of The Wall Street Journal. I can't click on anything. I don't have ads following me around. Uh, and, and it's like everything you need in one. You don't need more news than what's in a newspaper. My methodology for picking it, just as an aside, and don't worry, and don't get mad at me and troll if you're watching this video later, like somebody did earlier. Uh, at, I will make sure I timestamp it so that you can surpass me rambling about nonsense. But the reason I picked them is there was a Pew Research article on trusted news sources. And they had everything from uh, CNN and Fox News to The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, New York Times to BuzzFeed and uh, other things like that. And it was left to right politically how trusted or distrusted was the news source, unsurprisingly. CNN, more trusted by the left. Fox News, more trusted by the right. Um, the most trusted overall was The Economist, though it did tend to skew a little bit left. Uh, and the most trusted, uh, the, the one publication that was more trusted than distrusted across the board was The Wall Street Journal. Now their op-eds- Wall Street Journal was distrusted? More trusted than distrusted okay. across left and right. So I thought, okay, okay, if both sides, both sides agree that the Wall Street Journal is trustworthy, I'll subscribe to that. And I want the most trusted overall, which is The Economist. And the reason that's probably not uh, even more popular is because not most people don't want to read The Economist, although it's hilarious if you like British humor. Um, anyway, that's why I chose what I chose. Um, and also why I get the print edition is not because I'm some sort of Luddite who hates technology. Although one of my jujitsu guys last night told me that I am like the most anti-tech tech guy he's ever met. Um, and it's not the first time I've heard that. Uh, somebody at Dreamforce said, you're the most anti-tech tech worker I know. I'm not anti-tech, I'm pro-human. There's a difference. Did you guys listen to uh, that Trevor Noah episode with Sam Altman? No, I didn't. Uh, what Was it good? I think it was amazing. Like we got, I got insights into all of this open AI and the vision of Sam Altman, not just like how chat GPT, but like how it's going to revolutionize technology. And he had the same just point of view that you just said, I want to be, I'm not like super into tech, but I'm more pro, pro human. And wow. And Trevor Noah asked him like really intense questions about, what's the ideal chat GPT or AI for you? And then once you hear it from the horse's mouth, then you get a sense of where he wants to bring that AI technology uh, and which which comes to your point, right? More yeah. human and I'm not anti-tech, but I'm more pro-human. 
And that's what he wants to use AI Damn for. It. This is like what I found out LeBron James is a good human. I couldn't hate him anymore after that. It's like, oh, oh, he's just some young guy who got this big contract. He's probably a jerk. And then I found out he's not a jerk. And he's a good human. I was like, damn it. Um, yeah, <laughs> same thing with Sam Altman. Don't tell me I have more in common with the founder of OpenAI than I thought. This is going to ruin my whole shtick on LinkedIn. Why? Why? Maybe maybe there's some paths connecting in the future. Who, who knows? Who knows? And to answer the original question about what mug is this, this is an OG before the rebrand VetForce mug. VetForce was at the time both the name of the internal employee equality group at Salesforce and the what is now called Salesforce military program that exists outside of Salesforce to help people learn Salesforce, get certified, and get Salesforce jobs. Uh, these days, I'm a veterati coach, so I offer pro bono career coaching to veterans to help them ease the transition from their military service into the tech world. And it's worked pretty well so far. Still working with Erin to, to get her up and running, but we'll get there eventually. And maybe I'll just hire her my damn self. But I gotta get approval from my asshole boss. <laughs> All right, let's build a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in CBQ, shall we? <laughs> All right, we are yes. all familiar with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And that's part of why I use this as an example. When in doubt, use food to explain something because every human on earth understands what food is. Every human on earth loves eating food. Uh, there's not a single person that doesn't. So let's go ahead and start talking about the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But before we do, I wanna think about this conceptually. And I'm going to stop sharing for a second just so we can sketch this out on the whiteboard. This looks like a good spot to draw. Okay, great. Uh, pay no attention to some of these things. These are notes from a book that I read. The book is called Profit First. Very interesting book. A different way to think about accounting that was very useful to me. Uh, particularly, uh, it was a way of thinking about cash management as an yeah, entrepreneur or business owner type. Very useful. Profit First. Okay, peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Imagine this scenario. I own a business. I start another business. In addition to the jujitsu gym and Garvin's Consulting, I now start PB&J Enterprises. And PB&J Enterprises sells peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Because I want to grow my business fast, I buy Salesforce. There's your pitch, Salesforce. You're welcome. I'll take my commission check in the mail because uh, I'm a Luddite. And... We sell peanut butter and jelly sandwiches of all sorts of varieties. I have my Salesforce uh, instance up and running. And when I first started my business, because I was a startup and I was trying to move fast and break things, so hopefully not breaking jars of jelly across the floor of my business, I just used the amount field on the opportunity to track my deals. And then I started to realize I want to get more nuanced with my way of thinking about what I'm selling. I want to track the specific types of sandwiches that I'm selling so I can better manage my uh, supply and inventory of these different ingredients or so that I can better plan who I need to hire because somebody makes a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with strawberry better than grape. Who knows? This example is ridiculous for a reason. It's memorable. But then I realize I still have a problem. I have myriad product records in the system now because I, in order to figure out, did they get a white bread, creamy peanut butter, grape jelly sandwich, or did they get a wheat bread, crunchy peanut butter, strawberry sandwich? I have to have a different product for each one of those if I want to report on them, things like this. I suppose I could use a description field, but either way, you're dealing with something more qualitative. I want to get a more granular view. Besides, my creamy peanut butter, my crunchy peanut butter, strawberry grape jelly, my gluten-free bread. These all have different prices associated with them. They have different costs to me as the business owner. So I need to think about, well, if I want to get nuanced and start to understand the profit margins of each of these different sandwiches that I'm selling, I need to understand their price that I'm going to sell them at to the customer. And then I also need to understand what the cost of goods is going to be as I buy them so that I can sell them to the customer. And the difference between those two is gonna be our margin. Therein lies my problem. 
is that I don't have a nuanced way of thinking about this. So what's a person to do? This is where CPQ starts to come in. It's gonna give me the ability to configure a sandwich in a way that is uh, nuanced and offers me more control so that I can implement business logic. For example, I shouldn't sell a peanut butter and jelly sandwich to someone who, uh, 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 a white or wheat bread peanut butter and jelly sandwich to someone who's gluten intolerant. They have a peanut allergy. I need to know about that. And I need to ensure that they don't get anything with, with uh, tree nuts in it. Or I guess peanuts are not tree nuts. Whatever. I'm not a, uh, a, a botanist. I don't plan to be one. So we'll just assume that uh, peanuts grow on something and somebody's allergic to it. Great. And anyway, so now we have these different ingredients. They have different costs. We're going to sell them for different prices. Sometimes we might include the price in the sandwich. Is it vanilla, just plain old sandwich? Great. We might also have business rules around what's required with the sandwich and what's not required. For example, if you want to get a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you must select some type of bread. Makes sense, doesn't it? Otherwise, you're going to end up with a glop of peanut butter in your hand. Who wants that other than a three-year-old? So let's talk about the structure functionally of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and, and then start to figure out what our architecture is going to look like. Then I'll build it in the system. This is where I always start. The business, it's business technology. The business always comes first. We need to figure out what the business functions are going to be before we can actually go and start building stuff. I think this is where, especially with CPQ, but with software in general, people start building before they really have any idea of what they're building. And yeah, this goes against the move fast and break things thing, but if people moved a little slower, they would break fewer things and probably make more money in the process. I digress. We started off selling peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I kind of feel like Bob Ross in a way. I'm just going to draw a happy little ERD up here. The beard helps. The beard does help. I tell people I'm like an upside down Bob Ross. <laughs> Did you know, this is a fun fact for all of you trolls out there who hate when I go off on tangents. This one's for you. Um, Bob Ross's hair was not actually like that. Bob Ross got a perm when he was a broke artist so he could go longer between haircuts. Well, it turns oh, out he got famous while he had the perm and the brand stuck immediately. And then he could never change his hair because if he changed his hair, there goes the whole brand. He hated it. He hated it so bad. I also learned he was a philanderer. So, I mean, you know, there you go. Um, his happy little marriage was not so happy after all. I digress. Back to the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> I've got my peanut butter jelly sandwich here. Can you see this? Is the glare too bad? It's it is not helping. Yeah. How's that? Perfect. Okay, great. Maybe if I can, I wonder if I pin. Can I pin myself? Or if you could move your camera to the right How's because that? it's on the edge of. Uh, is that on the edge of the camera? Oh, uh, on the edge of the camera. Hmm. Yeah. But it's still like, I mean, I think it's still visible. Uh, so let's just move ahead with it. Oh, I'll do this. Okay. We'll do this. How's this spot on the board? Is this better? Yes. Okay, let's do that. I probably don't need that anyway. That project is almost done. Okay, so I got my peanut butter and jelly sandwich. This is what we're selling. We have multiple product records in there for peanut butter and jelly sandwich. We would call this product proliferation or skew proliferation. Basically, we got a bunch of product records and we're trying to look for ways to consolidate this because if we can consolidate the number of product records, there's less stuff for me to manage. And at the same time, we get more, uh, com we get more possible combinations because of our ability to mix and match. Um, can I ask a question, John? Yeah. When you say you have multiple products for peanut butter and jelly, could you give me a few examples of what those products are. Are those like individual breads or butter or sure. jellies or were they like combinations of different products? I'm glad you asked because this gives us a chance to talk about why we end up with so many products in the first place. 
a lot of customers, when you walk into a CPQ implementation, they're going to have hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, maybe millions of product records in their system. One client I had, what did they have? Uh, they had three plus million product records and, oh, we're going to decline that. They had three plus million product records. And they had a lookup object in CPQ that they didn't actually use that had more than, by the time I finished, 55 million records against it, which is, that's a whole other conversation. Long story short, I end up getting the search and rescue projects uh, because, <laughs> because that's, I guess, is what I do. Why did we end up with so many? Because if you go to, uh, in the, Last fall, I took a statistics class, and part of that got into combinations and permutations. So if you're looking for something to Google to find this out, let's take a very simple example. I have, well, peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I have three types of ingredients that I need to choose from. I have white bread, and I have wheat bread. I have crunchy peanut butter, I have creamy peanut butter, and then I have strawberry and grape jelly. Simple enough, right? Well, the problem that I have is if I want to figure out specifically how, what I've been selling, I'd have to find some sort of qualitative way to do this. Maybe the user types into the description, oh, this is what they bought. Now that's going to lack consistency and rigidity and stuff like that. So what a lot of companies will do is instead they'll say, well, how about this? We'll create a product record for each combination that exists. If we do the math on this, we end up with two types of bread, two types of butter, crunchy, creamy, and then two types of uh, jelly. That is uh, uh, strawberry and grape. But the way combinations work is that we're multiplying all of these together. Two and two is four, four and two is eight. So we would have eight product records in the system. Eight product records means that we're going to have uh, eight price book entries, even if we're only using one price book. Now let's complicate this further and say that we have two currencies. So now we essentially got two to the fourth. So now we would have, well, we'd still have uh, eight product records, but now we have eight product records and each of those has two currencies. Now, if you add another price book to the mix, now you have two price, we end up with a lot of records in Sorry different to. places. Right, right. So basically your, uh, when you say multiple products, they are combination of different permutations and combinations of your three basic uh, uh, product types. Yes. Now okay. imagine that I said with our bread, I'm going to have a gluten-free option and a sprouted option. Well, that's two more options. And for our jelly, I'll add um, strawberry, grape, raspberry, and blackberry jelly. So there's now four. And we've got, what is this? Um, and then for the butters, we got crunchy, creamy, almond butter. And then we're going to have, I don't know, um, Unsalted or whatever. Brazil, Brazil nut butter. So there we go. We got we got four. Well, four and four is 16. 16 and four is going to be what? Uh, 64. 64. So now we got 64 product records. Oof. Then we add our two currencies to the mix. Now there's another 28 One records. Brandy. We add another price book. Now we, it, it adds up really fast. It's not necessarily wrong. And when you don't have a way to configure, that's what you got to do. You have to create all of these different product records. And what you might do is you might have a naming convention where you say the name of the product record is going to be uh, EBJ dash uh, white dash creamy dash strawberry. There you go. That's one product record. And then I have one for raspberry. Then I have one for grape and so on and so on. So your naming convention, you could start to report on that. You could at least say that the product name contains strawberry or something like this. But 
What if I have instead of three attributes that I'm trying to track or three types of products, bread, peanut butter, jelly, what if instead I had a dozen? I had a dozen different types of ingredients. Maybe I start adding toppings to it. I kind of want to do a quick check. I think my dad is here to help plow the snow. Oh, well, I can edit this out later. It's fine. Or just leave it in because who doesn't want a day in the life? Mm. All right. So that's how we ended up with so many products in the first place. One of the things we need to do in most CPQ implementations is a reduction in SKUs. How can we go from 64 products down to the smallest amount that I possibly need? So if we get back to just what we would need in this example, we would only need 12 product records to hit all 64 combinations because I would have one product record for white bread, one for wheat bread, one for crunchy, creamy peanut butter. Each of these ingredients would have its own product record in the system. And then I use a wrapper product, a virtual bundle or the sandwich itself to kind of hold it all together, very much like literal sandwich, all right? So we would sell a peanut butter sandwich and inside of that, I have my breads, my butters and my jellies. Does that help? It does. Uh, however, I also, you mentioned the word attribute. Now in Salesforce, I mean, in Salesforce CPQ, don't we have this functionality that let's say we just have one product called bread and then we can have multiple different attributes of that bread, right? It could be yes. white bread. Yeah. Well, so. and, and this is where we get into a philosophical debate God. on what okay. is a product. Okay. So we'll get to that in just a moment. Okay. But that's a great sure. point that we will we'll put a pin in that. We'll circle back. We'll put it in the parking lot, backlog it. I just oh. want to see how many consulting words I can throw into a sentence. <laughs> All right. Pin on it. <laughs> when we start thinking about how we're going to architect this, let's think functionally about how we want to do it. We have the whole big thing that we're trying to sell, right? That's our peanut butter jelly sandwich. But within that, we have different types of products. We have different categories. Three different categories. In this case, we've got our bread. We've got our butters. Uh, we'll, I'll just do PB for peanut butter. And we've got our jelly. All right, we got three different categories. And then within that, we got different options available to us. Blah, 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 blah. The options inside are all of our different ingredients. When you're going to Chipotle, love Chipotle, free plug, I'll take my, well, maybe not a free plug, send me my commission check. Uh, you walk through the line, do you want white rice or brown rice? Do you want white uh, pinto beans or black beans? And you work your way through the line picking the different ingredients. Those are the ingredients that we have inside of our funnel. Now, um, from, from there, we can start to understand what I actually need to build. In CPQ speak, now that we're, we have a general sense of the types of products that we're selling inside of this bundle, we have a general sense of what the ingredients are, let's start putting some tactical and technical names to these things. What we have overall is a bundle. A bundle is simply a group of products that are sold together. You go to Ikea, instead of buying the refrigerator, you buy the whole kitchen. Whatever they have in that kitchen setup, that's what you're uh, you go to a restaurant, you order the meal. The meal is a combination of everything on the plate. You buy a car. The car has a lot of pieces and parts, but you're buying the car. So the bundle is the collection, the overall collection of products that you're purchasing together. Within that, we have different categories of these products. In this case, we have breads, we have peanut butters or various butters, and then we have jellies. And those different things are the types of products, the categories or the features inside of the bundle. Product feature. Is what those are called. And then within the features themselves, we have options. What are the specific choices that I can make on what this customer wants to purchase? We know that when they buy the peanut butter and jelly sandwich, they're going to need some bread. They're going to need peanut butter and they're going to need jelly. But which specific type of bread do they want? Which specific jelly, which specific type of butter? That's what the question that we're answering with the various options. So there's what they want to buy, and there's also how they want the sandwich to be made. Okay. From that, we can start to derive a whole bunch of other stuff, because if all of these exist as discrete product records, they can have their own price, cost, this, that, and the other. 
I'll talk, I'll, I'll still get to your attribute question here in a little bit. But are there questions about this so far aside from the attribute piece? Now I wanna know something else. Earlier I mentioned that we have some customers that come in and they're allergic to gluten. We need, a, we need an option for them. We also need to make sure that we don't accidentally sell them a sandwich with gluten. So I want a little checkbox here that says gluten-free, GF. We also have some customers that come in, they have allergies to nuts. Maybe they want some sort of different butter. They want coconut butter would be gross, but you get the idea. We would have some sort of alternative to peanut butter, but we need to know that they have uh, an allergy. And if one of these is checked, then I, the corresponding choices should just disappear. Let's make it easy to do it right and impossible to do it wrong. If Juanis is allergic to gluten, I want to make it impossible for me to sell him anything with gluten. Same thing with the allergies to, uh, uh, to nut allergies. Okay. These, now let's convert this over to CPQ. These two things at the top, these are going to be our configuration attributes. While I'm configuring what they want to purchase, how they want their sandwich, I'm going to gather these various attributes, different data points about what they want and how they want it or what they can and cannot have based on specific situation that the, the customer is in. Now let's get to your attribute question. Couldn't I just have a product record that says peanut butter and then I have an attribute that says crunchy or creamy? I do that. The debate that we have in front of us is what is a product in a earlier episode of office hours or earlier session is it a session or an episode i don't know it's not really a podcast but it's kind of a podcast i'm a white guy with a beard and an opinion on the internet is that a podcast is that what makes a podcast oh. <laughs> anyway so whatever this is called earlier i talked about how um, i used the example of trucks we sell red trucks blue trucks green trucks well are the is that three different product records? I sell red truck product record, blue truck product record, or green truck? Or is it I sell trucks and then I have an attribute to capture what color you want? You could debate this for a while. Or what about different engines? Do I want two different product records for the 2.1 or the 2.4 engine? Or do I want one product for an engine and an attribute that's 2.1 or 2.4? It's all an answer here. It depends. A lot of the considerations that you need to keep in mind are going to be specific to that particular client or your employer or whatever the situation is. How do you, and sometimes you might want the combination of the two. Perhaps I want two discrete product records for the engines because they have different costs to produce and they have Cost. different prices that I'm going to sell prices. them for. Maybe in some businesses, you might need to split them out as two different products because they might have different uh, invoicing requirements. They might have different tax implications. They might have different uh, diff different distribution centers you send them off to. I don't know, whatever. I'm making examples up. Um, yeah. So in that peanut butter example, uh, and apologies if I'm getting going on a tangent here, but let's say, uh, you know how in Chipotle you can add extra chicken for a price? Which is a so, damn shame, but I pay the price anyway. You can also get extra rice and beans for free. They won't charge you. Yeah, yeah, Pro yeah. Tip. But, <laughs> but like, uh, so you they you they get charged. You get charged for extra chicken. So in our case, uh, let's say if you are making a bundle out of three products, peanut butter and jelly, and if somebody wants extra peanut butter, so will that attribute control pricing or for that do we have to have a separate product for jelly you know what i mean i Is do that... it depends i'm okay. such a well, good again. consultant look at that i'm like a pro everything depends <laughs> here's here's how i might architect that i've architected something similar for previous clients sometimes what i like to do since it's both it's chicken in both cases or it's peanut butter creamy peanut butter in both cases, but i want an extra scoop mm. and maybe because it's the simple Creamy peanut butter, grape jelly, white bread. It's it, the 
five-year-olds love it. The um, but they want they want an extra scoop for the peanut butter. First scoop is free. It's included in the price of the sandwich itself. But the next scoop, oh, I need to charge something. Okay. So instead, but instead of standalone, there's a configuration. I can show you when we start to actually build this. But there's a configuration where I could have a second line for extra scoops. Okay. That might be how we want to do it because then I can configure each line to behave differently. All uh, of these different configurations, the different fields that you see in CPQ are ways for us to tell CPQ how it's supposed to behave. Okay. Each field answers a question. Should we charge for this? Or should we have a price for this or not? Should the price be editable or not? Is this a subscription and a recurring type of a product or is it a one time? One, one time. So all of these different questions are what we need our customers to answer for us. This is part of where the frustration comes in with CPQ. Clients will often, man, it feels like we're not making any progress. All you do is keep asking me questions. Right. It's not even you who sells the product knows the answer to these questions. Right. You haven't had to, um, it's, it is often the case when it comes to implementations of revenue cloud in general or these types of applications that the client needs to do a bunch of homework on their own before they're even ready for me to build stuff because they haven't thought to the level of nuance and detail necessary. Because remember, before today, they just created a whole bunch of product records. That's easy, that takes five minutes. But now we have to think about all the potential ways this product could be sold. And we have to answer all those questions. CPQ expects the answers. It'll do what we want it to do, but we have to tell it very discreetly and specifically in all of these different types of scenarios, how we want it to behave. And that's the part that takes a ton of time. And it's, it's part of what makes projects more complicated than people think they're going to be from the start. Oh, we have a simple business. We only sell five products. Oh, it's, it's very easy. I don't understand why this project should cost anything more than $20. <laughs> you know, uh, my toddler could build this. And I'm like, no, your toddler could build this. And it's going to be more than $20. And you have no idea how long this timeline is going to be. Uh, that's the reality reality when it comes to this shit is no one knows how long it's going to take it's all estimates so when this changes and you realize oh there's like a we thought it was a 200 piece puzzle and now it's we find out it's a 2000 piece puzzle don't get mad and yeah i know the picture is still hot air balloons but it's 2000 pieces of hot air balloons it's not 200 pieces of hot air balloons it's going to take longer go, but it's still hot air balloons right listen to the sentence i just told you um, so in this case, let's go back to the peanut butter and jelly sandwich, peanut butter and jelly sandwich. The reason I'm going to choose for this architecture to create different product records is because I want these products to behave in different ways. I want them to have different prices. I want them to have different costs. I want some to be included in the price of the peanut butter and jelly sandwich itself. I want others to be an additional fee for funsies. I want some to maybe be, um, uh, some might not be sellable in some situations than others. So if we take an attribute-based approach, we could still do all of those things, but the end result would be, I have to build a whole bunch more architecture that I don't need to build. Part of how we can think about this, I'm a consultant, I love quadrants. Let's make a quadrant. Uh, make a quadrant over here. myself a little more rope to hang myself with. There we go. We'll see how many uh, people I can piss off in each one of these revenue cloud videos. All right. I'm sure there's some people internally at Salesforce who, if they saw this, would not be happy at some of the stuff I'm saying. But hey, I'd rather be trusted than liked. Uh, we essentially have two broad approaches to configuration in CPQ. We have product-based configuration. We have attribute-based configuration. Product-based configuration is very much like the bottom half of this peanut butter and jelly sandwich. We have different product records in the system. We're going to configure these product records to do different things, behave different ways, be sold in different ways to people, et cetera. Then we have attribute-based configuration up at the top. Attribute-based configuration is where I'm collecting data points. So maybe the color of the truck or the size of the engine, whatever. And I don't want a whole bunch of extra product records. 
maybe I don't want it to be product attributes. I want a whole bunch of attributes. And then there's combinations. I want a lot of product attributes and I want a lot of products or I want very few of each. So we can start to think of this as essentially a uh, continuum. Like the products, let's see how I do writing sideways. Not too bad. And then we have uh, attributes. Okay. Products and attributes, and we can almost imagine a little dotted line down here in the middle. Now it starts to look like the Gartner quadrant of magical, whatever the hell they, it's the magic quadrant. What's so magical about your quadrant? Come on now. It's two, two attributes and you put them against each other. You can make a quadrant about everything. So down here we have limited attributes, limited products. Here we have high number of products, but no attributes. So that might be, when you get to the extremes here, up in here, this is gonna be our skew proliferation where we got tons of products. This down here, this is gonna look more like, uh, like a mixing board in a sound system where you just got all these little dials and knobs and levers and things that you can turn and twist and switch and all this other stuff. We're generally shooting for this. Generally, you want to be somewhere around here. We want a reasonable number of products and a reasonable number of attributes. The way I think about it is, if this is useful, not and not like the way that I think about anything is the best way. There are far smarter people than me in the world. This is just one guy's opinion on the internet. Take it for what it's worth. But I want as many as needed, as few as possible. As many products as I need, but as few products as I need, or as few products as I can. Same thing with my attributes. I'm striving here in mathematics, the idea is elegance. What is the smallest number of steps I can take to get to the solution? Here also, I want elegance. What is it? Beauty is the ultimate simplicity. Uh, I like to say simple works. Of the meta-ness of that sentence because it's a simple sentence but this is all i need i don't need anything more than this I'm about the simplest i can make it because if i was to do anything else i would either need to add more product records or i need to have way more attribute records here i have a nice balance There's a handful of products i got a handful of attributes that help and I could probably drone on and on about this for quite a while, but I see we're almost 20 minutes in, or no, we're more than 20 minutes in because we started half past, that's right. So we're almost 50 minutes in. Uh, I can, I'll keep going here. Um, but before I actually start building things in the system, I wanna make sure that we're on the same page on the whiteboard. Are there any questions so far? The, the question I have, and this is gonna be jumping ahead a little bit, is that once we put all of our bundles together, every bundle has to have every um, combination of products that can happen, correct? So if we wanted to have um, regular bread with chunky peanut butter and regular jelly, that would be one bundle. If we want to have gluten-free bread with chunky peanut butter and regular jelly, that'd have to be another bundle, so forth uh, and so on. Not quite. The way you're thinking about this currently is down here with our skew proliferation. The beauty of this is that when I have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, when I go into that product selection screen, I see one thing. You can only sell one thing at my shop. It's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Take it or leave it. Maybe a cup of coffee. But we have our peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That's it. You have one product you're selling. And then once we get to the next screen, now we're going to configure it, all of the ingredients inside the sandwich. See what I mean? So yes. all of the combinations, those, all of these combinations here exist within this framework. Does that help? It does. It makes sense. Thank you. Cool. We'll start building some stuff real quick. 
this will set up the next call. I can talk about a couple of other details too, and then I'll just keep using the same work to build out the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And I'll keep making the, uh, the peanut butter and jelly sandwich more, I don't wanna say, more complex, more difficult, more ridiculous as we go. And by the end, it'll be one memorable, uh, ridiculous thing. Sound good? And I'll keep referring back to the board as we go to start capturing, uh, so to try to map, because that's what we need to do. In order to learn this well, we need to map the functions with the technology. That's what we're always doing when we're architecting. What are you trying to do? Here's how we're going to do it. And hopefully my clients don't interfere too much and say, oh, we should build it this way, though. No, no. Sometimes you're correct, but other times you're dead wrong. Customer's not always right. They're often wrong, but so am I. Okay, now, here we are in Salesforce. I'm gonna start constructing the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And we could probably, in the next seven minutes, get at least a few things put together. In order to create any of the other pieces within, those features for the bread, the butter, the jelly, and the options, all of those items, with the exception of the features, the product and the product options, must exist first. I have to have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich product in the system because that's the parent that holds it all together. And then I also need the jellies, the peanut butters, the breads as product records as well so that I can put them all together. So I think in the next six minutes now, we can create most of the product records. In this particular org, we already have some of our like Genwatt power diesel whatevers. Wouldn't it be funny to sell a bundle that has a power generator as part of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? That would be a ridiculous example. Or when you buy a Genwatt 1000 kilowatt diesel generator, you get a free peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I think that would be kind of funny. Anyway, we're not going to worry about this too much. I'm going to create a product record. Peanut butter and jelly sandwich. The product is active. Product family, I don't really have one for it yet. And a product description. Uh, let's get real clever here. And I'll call this PBJ is gonna be my product code. I'll worry about a product family later. What I also notice here, if you think back on the on last week's call, we talked about installing the packages and all this other stuff. One of the things I have not yet done as part of the installation of this package is assign the CPP page layout to the product record. We'll do that in a moment. Because right now it is the bare bones to create a product record in the system. While I'm here though, I'll go ahead and create a price book entry for this. At a standard price, this particular org has only one currency at the moment. List price will be a ten dollars sandwich. It's expensive. We're in Brooklyn. It's fine. I don't actually live in Brooklyn. I live in the middle of nowhere in Illinois. Okay. Now, can I sell this product in CPQ? Let's answer that question. Orion's belt, three stars, have to align. I need an active product, price book, and price book entry. If any one of those three is inactive, the product cannot be sold in CPQ. I have an active product, price book entry is active. If I look at my standard price book, the price book, ah, it is inactive, which means that if I go to create a quote, I won't see this product because they're it's no active price book for it. That is quickly remedied. Active checkbox. There you go. Common, common, common mistake. I do it myself. I forget to activate something. It happens all the time. It's okay. Forgive yourself for doing it. It's going to happen. Go through your checklist. Orion's belt. One, two, three. Product, price book, price book entry. Are all three active? Yes. I still don't see the product. Okay, now I got to dig deeper. 
we can talk about troubleshooting that scenario in another call. But for now, I want to finish the last three minutes updating the page layout. And probably on the next call, we'll start with actually creating the rest of the products. Sound good? Great. Thanks for the input. Great grant. No yelling on the boss. When we install CPQ, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's installed. I think it's something like 60 or 70 objects. We've got page layouts, field sets, uh, all, all sorts of things. Some record types are in there, a whole bunch of triggers, blah, 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 blah. There's a whole bunch of stuff. Among the most important for us to configure is going to be our uh, page layout, but not the page layout for the price book. Sorry, I'm on the wrong object. I was concerned there for a second. On the product object, we're going to go to page layouts. I see that I have two page layouts now. If you're a newer admin, uh, you can assign page layouts to different profiles or types of users that you have. In this case, I'm going to keep things simple. Edit the assignment. I'll select all my different profiles and give them all CPQ. Don't worry, they still won't be able to edit anything. That's controlled with permission set licenses and permission sets and all sorts of other goodies around that. We can talk about that in some other call as well if you're interested in permission sets. I'm realizing more and more I have essentially endless content talking about this stuff. And now with the accidentally early launched but then removed article in the knowledge base about revenue lifecycle management, a new revenue cloud kind of thing. I don't really know how they're going to market it yet, but we'll see. Uh, there's a whole new set of stuff to learn. So great. But no worries if you're in this now, because there's still thousands of customers that have this product and they're not going to cut over overnight and trying to do some flow builder that automatically cuts it over. Uh, good luck. All right. Now let's go back to the product. Peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I'm going to refresh my page. I don't know if you can hear the snowblower outside. My dad's being a, a kind-hearted soul and is plowing my driveway, mostly so that he can use the snowblower, not his driveway. Anyway, here's my product. I now have the CPQ page layout applied to this. It was part of the managed package. It's installed as part of the managed package, but you need to remember to assign it to at least the system administrator profile. Here's my suggestion too on top of that. It is tempting because it's a regular page layout to move fields around. You can do it if you want. I'm, no one's gonna stop you. But when you're starting building this in a sandbox, uh, you cannot move a managed page layout into production, one. So you'd either have to copy it and then move the copy into production or the next sandbox environment. But also, if you're a consultant in particular, don't move fields around. Let them be where they are because you're going to look at dozens, if not hundreds of orgs over the course of your consulting career doing this. And just be kind to yourself and also to consultants like me who are going to follow you and fix the shit you broke. <laughs> and leave the fields where they are. It's going to make your life easier. And then you'll get familiar with each org that's <coughs> fields in the same spot. Yeah, go ahead, Mahal. Uh, a lot of times in CPQ, you add a lot of custom fields. Yes. So what's your uh, best practice approach when you use, we, to, when we use custom fields on this and when we want to move them? Uh, uh, to the page layout part of it? Yeah. Um, what I tend to do is I put... If, if the purpose of the field is pricing related, I'll try to include it in the pricing section, or maybe I'll put a separate section that says custom dash pricing and then custom dash oh, okay. CPQ configuration, custom dash subscriptions. So then I can call out those types of things. If you're gonna do that though, and you're very particular about where you want these fields, I would ultimately clone the page layout <laughs> and then put that in a change set. If you have change sets, if you have something else like uh, one of the development, uh, one of the DevOps tools that can do that for you. Do that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's my general approach. I like to cool. group like with like. So I'm going to put all my custom fields together, custom pricing fields, custom big fields, et cetera. Cool. Thanks. John, I'm sorry. Can I uh, jump in real quick to ask a yep. 
right. the same question actually uh, in a different way, but actually pertaining to chain set. Yes. Now you were mentioning that we could actually change that this like page layout. If you have a, a copy, because I'll show you the detail. The detail is, uh, 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 over here, I think I can see it from the screen. Yes. All right. This magical box up at the top, this product mm -hmm. is managed, meaning you can only edit certain attributes. This little icon here says that whatever this piece of metadata is, whether it is a page layout or... Oh, go to fields and relationships. Uh, we will see, uh, let me go here. Doesn't really matter which one of these fields I do, but we see the same thing up here, okay? Managed things, just like many standard things cannot be added to a change set. For example, the stage pick list field on the opportunity page layout cannot be added to a change set. It's a standard pick list. The same thing with the type field on the account or the type field on the opportunity. Those are standard Salesforce fields and therefore cannot be added to a change set. The same is true for a lot of metadata inside managed packages. In this case, we have managed fields, we have managed page layouts, we have field sets that are managed. So if we make changes to these things, we have to manually make changes in the next environment. Which brings me to uh, my next point, which is document the living hell out of everything, because you will thank yourself later. You will save so much time and headache and heartache um, if you if you document everything and and go ridiculous with it. I find spreadsheets work really well for me to keep track of this stuff. If you have DevOps tools, there are probably packages you can put together, this, that, and the other thing to help with this. But documentation is key. I would say that Less than 10% of CPU orgs that I've, or, or CPU clients that I've interacted with, and it's well over 100 at this point, probably over 200, maybe 10% have any documentation. And of those 10%, maybe 10% is actually decent. So you might have 1% of clients have decent documentation. It's unfortunate, but it's true. So you can so help. Yeah. Documentations, uh, are you referring to the documentation on the product that we're going to add in or the custom field that we're going to? Uh, you could do both. I mean, if I make a new custom field, I want to make sure, ideally, perfect state, that I'm filling out my description field and my help text. But what I'm also wanting to do is if I make changes to a pick list, let's say that I'm, let's go back to even core sales cloud. Let's say that on my opportunity type field, standard pick list, I add two pick list values. Those will not be at, you cannot add that field to a change set. Therefore, you must go into your next environment and add those same pick list values. So what you will probably want to do is have a spreadsheet that says, here's the object, here's the field, here are the two values that I added. And you're keeping track yeah. of it that way. Um, that way, it's, it almost forms a checklist. So then when you go to de deploy into the next environment, whether that's another sandbox or production, you can go down that checklist. Okay, check this field. Does that have the two pick list values? That, oh, it doesn't. Okay, I need to add them. Or it does. Okay, you're fine. But it helps you QA the work. And ideally, someone else other than you will check that work to make sure it's good. Second set of eyes is always good. As much as I know about CPQ, I always have somebody check it when I can. Because okay. there's, there's too much stuff. I'm going to miss something. Great information. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Because I've been uh, entering the product detail and I find that it's kind of tedious. You have to repeat the same old stuff. And I was trying to find a way to change set it from sandbox to prod. <laughs> uh, your DevOps tools are going to be the fast. If we're talking about deploying from environment to environment, DevOps yeah. tools are going to be your way to go if you want the mm -hmm. most efficient thing. Otherwise, you got to be meticulous and right. super detailed with everything you're going to do or you're going to miss something. Then you go through UAT and there's all this stuff you got to troubleshoot. So the more, there's a saying that the, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And for every hour I spend on documentation, I will save 10 in the future and thank my, thank my past self. I do this all the time. It's like, man, it'd be really great <laughs> if I documented how to do that. Wait, I bet I did. And then I'll like search my computer and I'll see, oh, 
Look at that. I made a Google Doc four years ago about how to do thank you, past John. So yeah, uh, I do that all the time. So yeah, it helps. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. No problem. Sorry, guys. I've uh, took so much of our time answering these questions. No, but thank that's, you. Appreciate no, it's it. fine. Everybody needs yeah, to know that's this what stuff. we're here for. Yeah. No need to apologize. Yeah. <laughs> we're all here to help each other learn. Um, speaking of that, that's gonna be it for today. We'll pick up next time. Join us next time on, uh, we'll get through creating the ingredients, create the features for this as well. And then it'll all start to come together. We'll start to see it. I'm also gonna include a couple of subscriptions in this because why not add some fun? We're gonna have a peanut butter PB&J club membership. So you have access to an online portal. You pay a certain monthly fee and then you can hang out with other peanut butter and jelly sandwich lovers uh, and talk all things PB and J and then a, a separate product for peanut butter and jelly sandwich support for when you get stuck and you can't figure out how to make your sandwich or you need some ideas, you can call the support line and you can get some of those as well. I seriously should start this business. I would totally kill it, but only in Brooklyn where people are pretentious. <laughs> Not all Brooklynites. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. I'm looking forward for the next session. I'm sorry. <laughs> Join awesome. in late. <laughs> no, it's it's all good. Join when you can. I, we're all busy adults. We got meetings and stuff. And I know sometimes people have a conflict. They can't make it. But we'll keep recording and I'll keep doing this because it seems to be helping people. Um, and then uh, I'll throw it up on YouTube and you can watch it later if you need to. And and all of that. But Okay, great work. Thank you so everybody, much. everybody and we'll see you Bye. next time. Have a great weekend. Bye. Bye.